Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Southwest District. Won't you put your hands together and give yourselves a round of applause. <clears throat> Did anyone get caught in the rain, by the way? At one point, it seemed like the sky, oh, we have several hands up. <laughs> Tonight, we have the fifth installment of a series of public safety forums scheduled one for each of the police districts. Thank you for coming out on a rainy, what seems to be wet evening on a Monday night. Uh, those of you who are here take public safety in your neighborhood seriously. So we thank you for joining us this evening. Many of you we met while out canvassing in your neighborhood. Many of you received flyers uh, talking about tonight. And some of you even received a phone call from the mayor inviting you to join us this evening. I uh, see some heads nodding and saying yes. Uh, so we thank you for taking heed to the invitation, accepting the invitation and joining us this evening. There are a couple people that I would like to introduce. First, the president of the Southwest CRC. How many know what CRC means? Raise your hand, someone. Other than the mayor <laughs> and the council representative. Vicki, you said you know what CRC, what is CRC? Community Relations Council, that is correct. Thank you so much. Uh, the president of the Southwest Community Relations Council, none other than Mr. Marty Howe. Won't you put your hands together and welcome Marty. My, I've never heard it so quiet. But I see a lot of faces here tonight that I don't see at the meetings. Okay. You have time to complain when things don't get done, but if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. But with, without further ado, we'll recognize our Councilwoman Helen Holding, Ed Reisinger, Pete Welsh, Delicate oat. Oats. When you get old, you forget stuff. And then we also have with us Chief Ford, newly, newly appointed uh, fire chief. But it is a pleasure to uh, meet and greet with those who I don't see all the time. And we really need to come together as one and by number, force by number. A lot of things don't get done, but that's not our aim. Our aim is to please and get our things done. I have a couple senior advisors that I will now turn over to them, but I really urge that you attend your community meetings and your CRC meeting is held at St. Benedict Church 2612 Wilkins Avenue in the rear, plenty of parking. We have some fun, and this, in May, the fourth Tuesday, we always meet the fourth Tuesday of the month. This will be our closing exercise for the summer, and it's a potluck. So if I have everybody here, we'll be able to feed two communities. So, Mr. Gus? Yes, sir. And I also would like to introduce Madam Mayor and our Commissioner Batts. We, Marty and I are tag team, teaming tonight. He actually stole my thunder. I was gonna introduce uh, the Mayor and Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake and Commissioner Batts. But before uh, we go, I just wanted to, anyone that needs a flyer or uh, a sheet of paper for your questions. Just raise your hand and we'll have someone uh, come around to you. Now I will hand it over and present to you Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. 
It is my pleasure to be here. Marty, thank you so much for opening us up today. And I want to thank my entire team. And I, and I certainly don't want to forget our principal. Our, where did our principal go? Thank you very much, sir, for hosting us today. Uh, you know, it is, I think, a mark of uh, true leadership when a principal uh, allows the community to uh, use the space uh, to improve the community. And, and, and it, it's a true, at that point, it's a true community school. So thank you very, very much. It's always good to uh, see you. And I want to thank all of the elected officials who are here uh, this evening. We I know that you all are probably feeling like you're on roller skates today because you had a council meeting this evening, correct? And thank you very much for, for being here as well. I want to thank Chief Ford, who has uh, been to every one of these, and I appreciate uh, the partnership. You know, first responders, are it's a broad group, and it includes our uh, fire and EMS. And, and thank you very thank you very much. Uh, Chief Ford has been out there with us as we're canvassing the neighborhoods. He's been doing the uh, community sweeps, putting in, uh, with his uh, men and women of the fire department putting in smoke detectors. If you know someone that needs a smoke detector, we are doing it. Uh, if you call 311 within two hours and they are free, they'll do a safety uh, check, a, a fire safety check for you and give install as many as um, the, the, fire, the, uh, the officer, firefighter, Seems necessary, so they're not going to shortchange you. They're going to do is you know look through the house and not checking to see if the beds are made or if there's dust in the corners. It's all about fire safety. So please, uh, I know it's, you know there are probably people in here that don't want to call because they, they don't want anybody in their house till it's clean. I'm this I'm the same way, but you, it's it's free, it's free and it's important. You know we had people when we knocked on doors for the last, um, you know, the, the, the last public safety was an elderly woman who needed one and was afraid to take it because she thought it was a charge. They said, no, it's free. It's free, it's free, it's free. And it's the 10-year battery that will last for, uh, you know, 10 years. So you don't have to go twice a year and replace a battery and have to deal with that daggone chirping. Makes me sick. All right, so I, I am probably getting the evil eye from my team that wants me to be quick this evening. Um, this is about hearing from you. Uh, you know my strategy, focusing on the most violent offenders, trying to make sure that we are getting uh, the bad guys and gals who uh, mean to do harm to our community off the street. We are fighting to have a more nimble police uh, force, one that embraces and uses technology to help us improve the crime fight. Uh, one that is proactive uh, so we can do more to get the individuals who we know are uh, causing harm in our community off the street. One of the things that I'm looking forward to uh, unveiling this year is the Operation Ceasefire, which is going to support that work. It is, uh, one, uh, it is an initiative that is driven by the support of the community. It is a way to target groups of individuals. Uh, some of these are gangs, some of these are more loosely affiliated, but they, are, uh, they, they act in groups and, and commit violence in our community. And with Ceasefire, we are uh, going to these uh, groups of individuals and saying, if you want to turn your life around, we have resources for you. You know, we have job training and all sorts of other opportunities. But if your intent is to continue to cause harm and disrupt our communities, that, that we are going to take all of the law enforcement um, partners that we have available, federal, state, city, everybody, and we are going to come down on you and everyone in your group. Uh, and that uh, ceasefire has shown great results in other jurisdictions that I'm looking forward to unveiling it later this year. We've been in the community talking about the, uh, the issue right now. They're doing the uh, data dive and identifying all of the groups and all of the individuals. And um, again, I'm looking forward to bringing them. I also I want to make sure I'm touching all of the points before I turn it over to our commissioner. Oh, this is the last thing. And I'll skip it. If I, if I, I know I'm going to miss something, I'll just bring it up later when we have the question time. Um, I believe very, very, very firmly you know, in my heart that Baltimore can be a much safer city. I know that you believe it too, otherwise you wouldn't be here. This would be a waste of your time, right? The only way that we're going to get there, and I'm proud of the progress that we're making. We are making progress. But the only way that we are going to see dramatic reductions and make them stick is to do it in, in strong partnership 
with each and every member of our community. So that's, this is what uh, this, the public safety forums have been about. How can we work together better? We have seen an increase in the number of tips that are coming in. Uh, over three times the number of tips uh, came in uh, year over year uh, and when we measured it last year. So we know we're, we are headed in the right direction. We're strengthening those relationships. And I even put more money in, the, in the, my proposed budget, and as I announced in my State of the City, for incentives, so for, with Metro uh, Crime Stoppers, if you turn in uh, someone and give us a tip that leads to an illegal gun, you are uh, you are eligible to uh, receive sig uh, significantly increased reward money. So hopefully, um, that will help us get more guns off the street. It is the only way it's going to happen. Uh, every change that any community has ever seen has been done in partnership with the community, and that's what I strive for, and that's what I hope uh, we will leave here strengthened and uh, convicted to do uh, even more together. So thank you very much for being here this evening. With that, I will turn it over to Commissioner Batts. And the mayor just bedazzled you guys. How are you doing tonight? Oh, that's pretty weak. Are you guys going to eat us? Are you guys doing okay? Yeah. All right. Thank you for coming out. Sincerely appreciate it. My name is Tony Batts. And uh, every opportunity that I get to be out in the community, I think that's the best part of my day. Spend a lot of time out on the streets. And usually I'm going to the areas that are very much impacted. If we have violence that takes place somewhere, that's where I go. That's where I spend, I spend my time and make sure that I, I get to touch, to see, to listen, and to make sure that the community has access to me. If you have uh, any meetings uh, that you like me to attend, uh, I'm out here almost every single night at some community meeting at some part of the city. So don't hesitate to uh, give me a call. All I ask is give me some give me some time to stretch it out because because I say I will come. People take me up on that. So I have a lot of people asking me to come to different uh, events, and I will be there. We had a very busy weekend this weekend for us. We had na this is National Police Week, and I have to take time to say that that's because we are honoring those officers who have given their lives in a line of duty protecting the different cities throughout the nation uh, who uh, their families have given up uh, their lives uh, to support us the things that we do. We're going to have a big celebration down in Washington, D.C. this week. Uh, so if you see a police officer driving by at some given point in time, I want you guys to do like this to him, okay? Practice with me. Come on. Come on. Thank you so very much. I appreciate that. Councilman, you did that very well, so I thank you so very much. Uh, just quickly, uh, members of my organization, Lieutenant Colonel Sean Miller, who I just recently promoted, Captain Eric Pekka, who's in charge of, uh, who's the second in charge of the Southwest District under Jim Hanley, who's uh, the major, who's uh, at work this weekend, so he has the, the day off because he worked. Uh, quickly, you know, one of the things that drives me is this document here. Uh, this is our uh, strategic plan. And the reason that this is so significant for me is that this is our corporate business plan. And when I walked in the door, I wanted people to be able to hold us accountable, hold me accountable for what we're doing and what we're not doing. If you want to know what direction we're going, it's in this document. When young recruits come out of the police academy, they're tested on this document. When you want to be a sergeant, we build, we build that test around being a sergeant on this document. When you want to be a lieutenant, we build that test around Thank you so very much. So this is a focus for the police department. I'm glad you're paying attention. I sincerely appreciate that. Every Monday when I sit down with my command staff, it's based on this document. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. I appreciate that. And the reason that that is so critical is that document is built around what this community wants from its police department. It's not built around what Tony Batts thinks that we should be doing. It's not built around anyone else other than the community. We went to the community and asked this community, what do you want from your police organization? And in that document, they say, deal with violent crime, job number one. Number two, we want to be able to call 911 and get an officer there when we're calling a, a police officer, gangs that are out there. And then number four, which a lot of people don't pay attention to that we don't hear about, is, is property crime. The community said, and these four numbers are fer fairly close in that document to, uh, to each other, which is the violent crime, which goes with number three, which is the gangs. Uh, number, number two is, when I pick up the phone and I want a police officer, I want a police officer to come. And number four is property crime. Now, the mayor is pretty clear on what she, her expectations, and she's saying that uh, job one is dealing with the violent crime. But for me also, the probability or possibility that a woman walking down the street 
and may get hit in head and drug into an alley and raped, that's critical for me. That's important to me. The fact that somebody can break into your house when you're there late at night, that's important to me. Those are burglaries. And if you're walking down the street that somebody can take your phone or take your property, that's important to me. And so all these categories are important. Violent crime is extremely important because we don't get to lose human life within this city without having a focus and we have to reduce it. But also the other possibilities that you will be a victim in a lot of different ways are things that we're focusing on. So in that document, it comes down to, our strategic plan comes down to three C's. And the first C is crime, and we talked about crime. The second C is community. And that document there again is built around listening to the community. The reason that the mayor has us out here is to listen to the community. What I'm pushing my organization to become is a customer-driven police organization, which means that we don't tell this community what they want. We listen to this community. And we build their needs into the imperatives. And so that's what we're doing, and that's where we're going to move forward. The last C is credibility. And what that means is that I don't have a tolerance for the scandals. I don't have tolerance for the misconduct that's out there. And what we're pushing for in, in this organization is to build a professional police department that you're extremely proud of and that you don't see negative stories popping up in the news. Uh, the last thing that i like to say is that uh, through negotiations, uh, we as a police organization and in the leadership of the mayor is that we're trying to work out making sure our organization is paid well so we don't have police officers leaving, going to other places that were competitive, and that, was led by the, that charge was led by the mayor. So as we go forth, whether it's technology, whether it's having compensation that is correct, and we're doing that compensation by making the organization more efficient. And so we're not asking for other, or other um, means to make that happen. We're trying to become the most efficient organization. Again, based on that corporate business plan, that's what you hold us accountable for. You can pull it off the web. You have access to everything that I have access to, to uh, with the exception of probably 2%. And that 2% 2, 2 is my deployment numbers, where I put the police officers at different times. So I don't want the bad guys to know where we're putting police officers uh, at. But uh, we're number one, we're changing technology, we're improving. We're improving the pay scale. We're getting proper training to the organization. We're moving in the right direction, and you will see the progress as we continue. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Is it hot in here to anybody? Yes. Man, we got a lot of energy on that. See, the problem, the problem with that is that when you have a bald man when he gets hot, it's embarrassing because I have nothing to stop that, that sweat from coming in my face. I look forward to the questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Commissioner Batts. Briefly, we have a presentation, Madam Mayor, residents, uh, from the principal of this fine institution. Uh, won't you please welcome Principal Carl E. Perry. He has a brief presentation. Good evening. Good evening. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to Edmondson Westside High School. Once again, I'm the proud principal Carl E. Perry of Edmondson Westside High School. And I, I heard the commissioner say he was a tad bit warm, but it's not even hot in here to us yet, so please understand what we, what we deal with. But, but we continue to move forward. I'm sure that recently you've heard some information that we, uh, we lost two young men over the past five months. And April 16th, we lost a young man named Michael Mayfield. Uh, Michael was... I can't sit here and tell you how wonderful he was. Um, and it was a tremendous loss. But we are beginning something called the Michael Mayfield Project. And I wanted to give the mayor and the commissioner our brand new t-shirts for the Michael Mayfield Project. And everyone who receives this, all of my students who received it today, uh, also received a pledge, and I'm also going to give this to the mayor and the commissioner. What we are doing is we are a true community, and we're going to stop the violence. The violence hits home, and it really, really set us back here at Edmondson Westside High School tremendously. Um, we're going to stop the violence in school. We're going to take this act onto the road. We're going to stop the violence in other schools as well. What we're trying to encourage our students to do is peer out of the window. Let's count, counteract the, uh, the stop snitching. Let's peer out of the window and call someone. You don't have to be known, just peer out of the window and call someone. In addition to that, our emphasis is pick up a book, not a weapon. 
So we're going to start this at Edmondson Westside High School and get it out to the entire community. And that's why we're here. We were presented with the opportunity. We want you to be here. Come into the school anytime you would like. As for me, as for my, my outstanding assistant principal, who's a, 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 he will be a principal next year, Mr. Said Hill. And we're going to carry the Michael Mayfield project out. And welcome once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Apparently, there was a memo that went out, Mr. Perry, that you would coordinate your colors with Madam Mayor. So it was a great photo opportunity. <laughs> Tonight, now that we begin the Q&A, the question and answer portion of uh, the forum, mm -hmm. I would like to introduce a few community leaders who are joining us here on the front row. We have uh, Ms. Monique Washington, uh, representing Edmondson Village. If you just raise your hand, Ms. Washington, or stand up, feel free. Representing the community I actually was born and raised in, by the way, Ms. Washington. Uh, next to Ms. Washington, we have Ms. Cynthia Shaw, uh, president of the Lynnhurst Community Association, a recent recipient of the Top Mom, uh, the Mayor's Top Mom Award. And she has the Pandora bracelet to prove it. It's beautiful. It yeah, sure is. is. Yes, it. <laughs> they don't make them in your side. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I'm sorry. It's a beautiful. And Pan it I is. thought Pandora was nice to do it because they made, for each mom, they, they tailored it to the, the mom. And it was, a, you know, sometimes you all you can do is give them a citation, but I thought it was nice of them to, mm -hmm. to do that. And it was a lovely, lovely event yes, it was. for some great neighborhood moms. Yeah. And next to our top neighborhood mom is, we've already heard from, the president of the CRC of the Southwest District, Mr. Marty Howell. And next to Marty is a dynamic couple, uh, a couple I've had the privilege, Madam Mayor, of meeting with several times and meeting, uh, connecting at various events, and that is Mr. and Mrs. Elsie of the Gwynbrook Garywood community. They've known me since before I was I, born. I know. <laughs> so I'm expecting at least one softball question. <laughs> So tonight we have, uh, and we're joined by representatives from various other community associations, those of which we will hear from uh, throughout the night, like Mr. Chris Williams of Hunting Ridge, like Mr. Hunt of, yes, like Mr. Hunt, Mr. Hunt of Hubastan of the Rosemount uh, community, also president of ARCO, many of you are familiar with. So tonight we will have questions from community leaders, one question, then we will go to uh, the floor with two questions and then back to the front row for one question and then so forth and so on. Uh, kicking it off tonight will be Ms. Shaw who has a question. And by the way, holding the microphones are Mr. Chris, Christian Song to my right, your left. Come on a little closer, Christian, don't be basketball shy. And to my left, your community liaison, None other than Mr. Larry Nunley. <laughs> so Mr. Nunley will be holding the microphone and allowing Ms. Shaw to ask her question. See if the microphone is on. The question cool. for the Lyndhurst community has been touched upon tonight by the mayor when she talked about the ceasefire program and also touched on by the principal of uh, Edmondson Westside High School with the uh, tribute that they're doing to Michael Mayfield. So the question is this, along with increased drug activity in our community. We have had an increase in youth violence. That's what was talked about tonight. What programs are in place, which we heard of one, ceasefire, 
Um, what uh, other things can we do to help our young people to deal with their anger, to set positive goals, to make positive decisions for their future? Because not knowing what they're doing once they go to jail, that's their future. Uh, to help develop their self-esteem. Uh, what other programs are in place? What can our community, our community association do to help these young people, to help the parents dealing with these young people and the violence and the gang activity? Thank you uh, very much for um, the question and, and really for all that you do uh, and, and really care for our kids. I've, I can't tell you how many times I've said it. we can't arrest our way out of this, uh, the issue of violence, whether it's adult uh, violence or youth violence. We have to look for other ways that we can engage our young people. So when you talk about all of the different ways, it's everything, whether it's mentoring. You know, there are so many uh, organizations that, um, that uh, mentoring big, big brothers, big sisters, uh, and help identify those young people that need uh, assistance. Uh, there is, you know, things like the Youth Baltimore, I mean, the uh, Be More Night Hoops uh, program that we had. We had two different age group leagues uh, that just had the, the um, playoffs over the weekend, uh, trying to find uh, more ways for young people uh, to engage. Youth works, trying to connect young people with jobs. If you know of organizations that can actually hire, and in some of our neighborhoods, the community association has hired young people through the youth works program themselves. You know, uh, raise money to hire a young person and do, you know, clean up and different uh, things. Kids need, you know, more jobs. Every year we have more children, more young people that sign up to want to work in the Youth Works program than we have uh, jobs for. And we work very hard to, to maintain the funding even when the federal government pulled that funding back. So that's out there. But I could go on and on and on. But it is, it's not rocket science. You know, these kids that are falling through the cracks are doing it because, uh, you know, they think nobody cares. Because in their mind, you see what's going on. You see what they're doing and nobody's saying anything. We have to get back to a place where we, we are saying something about it. And if people don't feel comfortable saying it to them, say it to their parents. If you don't feel comfortable, say it to your, their parents. Say it to the police. But when you think about the, you know, the kids that are uh, running rampant through the streets, uh, particularly on the weekends on the dirt bike, right? Yeah. Now, I'll tell you, 12 noon on Sunday, these dirt bikes aren't dropping out of the sky, right? They're getting them out of their houses, out of their garages, and they're taking them out, right? But when we watch them after they're popping the wheelies and causing, you know, causing accidents and making people scared. All the, and we watch them after all of that all Sunday afternoon and then watch them put them in the, put them in the garage and nobody says anything. What, what's going on? They're saying, they're saying that we agree with it, right? If we see it and don't say something, as far as I'm concerned, we are giving them permission to act like fools in the street, giving them permission to make, um, to, to cause accidents and cause that danger. We have to say something. Because if they're doing it in a home where the parents are turning a blind eye, somebody has to say something. So that's the kind of stuff. It's the common sense stuff that we, we used to do as a community that we need to get back to doing more of. Thank you. If I can uh, also uh, chime in there uh, with what the mayor is saying. And uh, my tact is kind of pushing back too a little bit. You know, every time that there, there's a uh, concern within the neighborhood, people fall towards the police department. Now, with us, and I don't shy away from that, my shoulders are pretty wide and my, my skin is, is pretty thick, uh, but uh, our, our abilities to address things deal with locking people up. We can lock people up, we can give citations to people, we can bring communities together and have conversations, but the reality is that and, and I say it from my point of view, I didn't grow up in Baltimore at night, and I always have to apologize for that. And I go through a litany of the high schools so people know uh, that uh, I understand that if you're from Baltimore, it's from West High School that you you're come from. But if in my reality, where I grew up in South Central L.A., uh, a lot of the problematic issues that uh, exist here within, within this community, you trying to tell me I'm sweating too much? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. Uh, but a lot of the issues that, uh, that are existing in our community I had the opportunity to discuss on Saturday 
Uh, on Saturday, I had uh, mothers who have lost their children to violence within the city. And I was, there, I was the keynote speaker there. And one of the things that I said is that I, I don't know what it is to lose a child. My, my children are all adults. But I do reflect back to my childhood in that if it wasn't by the grace of God, I could have went left, I could have went right. Because there's none of, a number of my friends who did go the wrong way, uh, who did get involved in things that they shouldn't. I, had, I was very lucky to have a very strong mother who either kept me in school, kept me in church, or kept me in sports. And anytime my hands weren't full, she put something in it and kept me doing with different things. And it was only because of that is because I didn't end up like a number of my friends did. And then there was another piece. There was another piece that I didn't see a long time ago was a person in a uniform who happened to be a police officer that touched me. And that touched me and, and became a mentor to me. And so what I say is I've been a product of mentoring. I've been a product of an adult saying, let me touch this child and it make an impact. Now, people can look towards us to solve all the problems within our community, but there's a responsibility also within the community to get involved beyond just talking about it, beyond just having conversations. And there may be people out there who don't feel comfortable, and I, and I get passionate about this in these meetings, and it's not an act for me. But there may be people who don't feel comfortable talking to a 16-year-old kid because some of these young people out here are kind of hard. They're, the reality is just true. There's some kids out here because I deal with them. I get out of here in the streets. I talk to them, I'm, I, and I'm, I try to, to uh, disarm them, bring the tension down to have uh, honest conversations with them. But here's the other reality is that you can these 16, 17-year-olds didn't get here today. They didn't just come out like the mayor said. They just didn't fall out of the sky. They started as babies. They started as five-year-olds. They started as six-year-olds. Now, that's something that we can make an impact. You know, people say this is overly simplistic, Tony Batts, but here's an issue. If a child can't read by the time they're in the third grade, most likely, a high probability is that they're not going to graduate from high school. And how significant that is, if you can't read by the time you're in the third grade, you start disconnecting from school. You start disconnecting from those pieces of hope that are going to make a difference in your life. So what we can do start with is five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds. There's things that we can do. And they may be young people that don't look like you, don't speak like you, don't even have the same value system that you, don't ha you have, but you can make a significant difference by stepping up away from the conversation, away from talk, but stepping up and making a difference in a young person's life very early in life. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> As we, before we go to the next question, I just wanted to do two things. One, and that is acknowledge uh, Ms. Allen of the Edgewood community, if you would just raise your hand and everyone can see you. Um, she's on the side of the pole, she has a white hat on, she just raised her hand. And I wanted to apologize to Delegate Oaks. Uh, while you, Larry was talking, Delegate, there's a camera right over your left shoulder. Uh, couldn't see the mayor while she was speaking. So that was, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. <laughs> we, had it, we have it all on tape. <laughs> there was a hand up on my left hand side, and I wanted to, yes, sir. I knew, I knew I saw uh, on on your on my right, your left. Yes, sir. Please stand up, and Christian will give you the microphone. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, Evangelist David Williams, representing the Boyd Booth community. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is this: In the next few years, what programs are in place to provide funding for youth centers or recreation <coughs> centers? And are we in alliance? Are you in alliance with any churches or spiritual-based organizations that actually have to have the space to uh, provide for these youth programs? And have you considered funding for those things? And last but certainly not least, uh, it just seems that one of the reasons and one of the situations that have taken the youth out uh, into the world the way it is because we have eliminated things like art and music in schools things that used to keep them grounded in a way and have we considered replacing these things so that the schools can help absorb uh, a portion of them not being out on the street with respect, first thank you uh, for coming and um, with respect to the the youth programs and rec centers that was something that I feel very, very strongly about. And for me, the issue of uh, rec centers was multi-pronged. You know, we have centers in the city, had centers in the city, where, uh, and some of them are in the in, in southern and southwest, uh, and uh, Councilman Reisinger's district, 
you know, we would have in, in one area a rec center where two to 300 kids are coming in a day and using the programs. Then we have uh, some where it would be a whole month and not 200 kids came in. And we're paying the same amount, you know, the same staffing levels for all of those things. Run down, you know, when, when I ask community people, the, I got a, a group of community stakeholders together, and I think uh, Councilman, um, the Vice President was part of that group. They went to every single rec center and gave it a grade for the uh, programming, for the number of families that were served, um, for the facilities. And um, after giving it a grade, it became clear that we had to do better. You know, a lot of the conversation had been about, well, nobody's going to travel to go to a rec center. We have to keep this one open, that one. Other. Well, nobody's going to travel. It's not because it's, you know, three, three further blocks away. They're not traveling because it's run down. Is run down and we're not offering what young people want and what families want. So I wanted to do better. So we took a hard look at all the recreation centers. We made a recommendation to close them, some, but we also at the same time set forth a plan to grow our recreation centers into the large community centers that we've already started opening throughout the city. The next one is slated for uh, to be built in Cherry Hill. And what the community said they wanted as a result of that, uh, that uh, work group, the task force was uh, larger centers, things like um, commercial kitchens or kitchens so people could actually use it to hold events. They said they wanted more programming. They said they wanted more staff people and longer hours. And I started on that path to give uh, the community exactly what they wanted. Does it mean you have to make some sacrifices to get there? Everybody knows you can't spend the same dollar twice. You can't spend a dollar to keep the old rundown thing that people weren't using open and at the same time plan for the, the future. So I didn't mind you know, having that tough conversation with people because I knew that at the end of the day, we were planning for better. So each year, um, we, are, we are doing groundbreaking and ribbon cuttings on uh, new centers. Each year, we're looking for uh, partnerships with, you know, we've had, we opened it up, the, the centers that we knew we were closing, we opened it up to communities, church groups, anybody who wanted to. If you had uh, brought a program and you showed us the capacity to run those programming, we worked with you. And we had one center in West Baltimore um, that we were able to reopen that had been closed for years because a community group stepped up and they um, said that they could you know, use it as a, as a community center for the mentoring work that they do uh, and after school programs and we were able to do that. We have several centers like that. So yes, I'm willing to partner. Uh, please contact the um, Department of Recreation and Parks. The director's name is Ernest Burkeen and I would love to do that. And uh, with respect to the faith community, Yes, we have several initiatives where we work with the uh, faith community. I um, believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the leadership roles that uh, our faith leaders have. I have leaned on them on several occasions to help us in these efforts and will continue to do it because uh, if I think we are all fooling ourselves if we don't think that the children that are out there doing these things don't need faith support as well as family support. You know, we can't so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So yes, I'm willing to work with them. Okay, so I see a plethora of hands. We had a gentleman in a black t-shirt, had his hand up, and then we will come back to Mr. Marty Howe. Where is Marty, by the way? Please. Good evening, Mrs. Mayor. Good evening. I have a question pertaining to the red line for you. From Emerson Avenue only, from Emerson Avenue going down to Hilton Street, there's only going to be two lanes of traffic there. There's only actually going to be one with the buses stopping. How are these people supposed to travel back and forth through West Baltimore with one lane of traffic? So is it, are you going to tie it into public safety or is this just a red line? This is just a red line question. Okay, so. I will be willing, and, and um, Mr. Song can get your information so we can follow up on that. This is specifically, and I, I hope we were clear, this is, this is, we are focused on public safety. All right, so I'll take your public safety question and we will get back to, Kristen, we'll get your information and we can talk about My the My public line. safety question is to Commander Vex and the lieutenants and, the, uh, and his officers. So I live in the community of West Hills. We very seldom see a police officer over there in fact, West Hills is a community where there's motorcycles and vehicles with, with illegal registrations. 
So what does, what does it take to get, do we have to call, call 911 in order to get your officers to respond to our community? Could you step right over there and get his address and uh, his location and you'll have officers there? Uh, that's that's that, that easy. Uh, you're making me aware of it, we will address it. The second thing is that what I didn't address is the motorcycles. And uh, that's, a, that's an issue for this entire west side of our city as a whole that are getting impacted on, on Sundays. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, I told that young man there who has no hair on his head, he's a, a bald version of myself also. I told him that uh, when I was coming to these community, community meetings at nighttime, that's a critical problem for this community. It's been impacting the community for a lot of years, about 20 years. We're going to try something a little different. Because last year what we were doing is that we were doing covert raids on where they're storing the motorcycles. Uh, we were getting information. Community actually was calling in telling us where they were storing motorcycles and we were going doing search warrants. Dirt bikes, I'm sorry, dirt bikes, uh, where they were, they were storing them, and uh, we were uh, taking them into custody and trying to destroy them. And I want to do that again. So we still need people to call in. Uh, apparently what my guys were telling me is that there was a film that just came out recently that glorified uh, this dirt bike riding that's actually taking place in Baltimore. And we're starting to see more people come from other states because of the glorification of this. And I told and I shared with him is that we're going to take a very um, proactive stance and we're putting together, putting it to, together some initiatives that are going to take place in the very near future. But we're going to try something different, too. Uh, a lot of these young people uh, contact each other on social media, and they talk on so social media and communicate. One of the things I did in another city on the West Coast that I came from, it wasn't dirt bikes there, it was cars. And they were calling it Ghost Ride the Whip, where they jump out of their cars mm -hmm. and let the cars drive off by themselves. Uh, there again, much like here in Baltimore, we were, we were impacted there about 20 or 25 years of this activity. What we ended up doing is, is saying that uh, we're going to track social media. So if you're organizing or if you're the organizer of bringing all these people together, if there's a crime that takes place, we're going to have criminal charges filed against you for organizing for criminal activity. And when we started looking at taking off the heads uh, of people organizing these things, we also uh, looked to, to go to YouTube and put messages out there by uh, people who were seen as icons by the young people out there in the street saying that this isn't safe. It cut for the first time. It reduced and stopped that activity over the first time in 20 and 25 years. We're going to do the same thing here, and i got to talk to the state's attorney. If you're organizing these dirt bikes, if you're organizing to come to Drew Hill on, uh, on uh, the Sundays or ride through the neighborhood, I think you should be held accountable. If there's an accident that takes place, if a kid gets hurt, if a shooting takes place, if any criminality takes place whatsoever because you organized it, just like, like a person uh, uh, organizing a concert, you should be held accountable, and you should be held accountable for criminal actions. Once they start to understand that when you organize this, we're going to put this blame on you, I think we'll start uh, uh, tearing this apart a little bit. So we're going to do some covert activities that are going to take place, much like we did last year. Uh, we're going to bring in a lot of resources on Sunday to start addressing these things, and we're going to deal with the social media, hopefully with the state's attorney support, in a different direction. Uh, Sean, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yep, actually the state's attorney who will be involved in the case is sitting in the back, uh, Ms. Katie O'Hara, who handles the uh, Southwest and Western District. Like the commissioner said, and can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, I apologize. Like the commissioner was speaking about, we have a lot of different covert activities in play. We actually just finalized the meeting today at one o'clock to get everything rolling. And these kind of, uh, these initiatives that we will do will entail the usage of the helicopter, covert surveillance online, uh, infiltrating these organizations within the social media networks like the commissioner was speaking about, as well as uh, actually infiltrating them real time with possible undercovers deployed amongst them in a covert surveillance capacity. Uh, you know, a lot of these young men that ride these dirt bikes in your city, in West Baltimore, Southwest Baltimore, a lot of them are not from here. They actually bring these motorcycles in from out of state, and the social media is the connection between these groups to identify not only the heads like the commissioner was speaking about, but the underlings who actually follow them to your neighborhoods and your streets to cause havoc. So once we eliminate the top portion, which is organizing the issue, then the bottom will fall apart on itself. And then if they try to regroup, we can do the same thing again and take them down again and again. But you know, a lot of that will be specifically encompassed on the information that we get from you, the community. If you're not providing us the information real time or calling 911 or 311 about where you see these dirt bikes riding, then we're not going to be able to deploy real time to them. So with your help, with the help of the state's attorney's office and what we're going to do in the police department, 
I have no doubt that we will be able to solve this problem for you. What's our friend from the state uh, state's attorney's office? Katie O'Hara. Katie. Hey, Katie, when we take these motorcycles in, can I crush them? Please. Can I just crush them? Okay. You can tell me that later. I'll tell you that later. Okay. And Thank Kristen, you, please. Christian, um, please make sure to get the gentleman's contact information so we can follow up on this red line issue. Thank you. All right, in the state of New Jersey. One, one second, sir. We're going in order. Gus? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the lady in the purple will come to you with a question, and then from there to Mrs. Elsie. And Larry, if, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Watch the camera. All right. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Mrs. Smith from the Southwest Better Neighborhood Association. Good evening, Mrs. Smith. Uh, I want to thank uh, Helen Houghton and the mayor for keeping our center open because at one time we thought that center would be closed. So we're very happy to still have the center at the Mary E. Rodman Center still open. My question is, uh, we have had two break-ins in the 100 block of Edgewood Street where I live, which is unusual for us. Uh, the neighbors came to the last meeting and asked uh, could I call the Southwest and asked could that area be patrolled for a while at night, maybe from around 12 to maybe three or four because both of these break-ins from my understanding were between those hours. So we're asking if maybe we could have uh, a little more patrol for a while. And my second question is, uh, we often ask our neighbors to burn their lights for better safety. And so many of them talk about the cost. And we try to relate to them that it's not a lot of cost in burning those lights, which, which would be safety. Is it any way that maybe neighbors could be encouraged to burn their lights front and back? Those are my questions. Thanks. So definitely we can, and I'd love to get, uh, with respect to the lights, um, I'll make sure that we follow up uh, with officer neighborhoods and see if there's a way to partner with uh, something like bg &E that all that partners with us on the energy efficiency efforts and energy efficiency education. I think if we could uh, work with them to make sure people, like when you, when you go and you get the uh, energy efficiency check, if BG comes and uh, does it, or if you get the education, they'll give you the energy efficient light bulb. So the, the cost is, is it's insignificant. It's a very, when you use those, those uh, high efficiency lights, um, the, the cost of keeping those lights on is so little, uh, but people have to hear it and they have to understand it. So I'll certainly um, make sure that uh, Office of Neighborhoods connects with Ms. Smith so we can uh, get, that, get that resource out there. Um, with respect to the 100 block of North North Edgewood uh, Street, it is unusual. You know, I grew up. My, my uh, grandmother was in uh, was 208 North Edgewood, so one block over. And I think so. That's up, right? Right. So I think that's where that's my first. That was the right. I think that's the block where I was when because we lived one block over when I was first. In the house that I that I was, oh. Well, I only, I was I and was only there for 18 months, so I I don't have there. I I know I lived in there, but I don't remember a whole lot. She's um, keeping the light on for you, Madam. So you're keeping the light on. Thank you. I appreciate it. They're gonna make it a monument one day. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But no, it is unusual. That Very is. unusual for that block. And I'll let uh, Commissioner and the and the Major talk about that. Well, I'm going to have the major explain a little bit uh, what he's doing in the district. Uh, one of the things that I get a report on is every 24 hours. Every 24 hours, uh, I sit down with my entire command staff and we go over every single district, every single crime that takes place in the city. What we're really seeing in the Southwest as a whole, and then specifically he's going to talk about your street and how we will respond to your area and have resources out there, is that uh, we, we saw a lot of vacants being burglarized in this area. Uh, especially at the at the beginning of the year, and so we did. We made a concerted effort to track the people down who were doing that. We made a number of arrests and took the guys to jail. Another another trend that we're starting to see in the community is the taking of air conditioners, large large air conditioners out of the backyard. 
And uh, I don't even know what a compressor is, but the guys are saying they're taking full-blown compressors. So the question for me, I, I started to ask, are they cutting the lines, ripping it out, taking it? But they're, they're taking their, their time to unscrew uh, the compressors and the lines, and they're taking the entire thing as a whole. So we're going back looking, even if, uh, and I, I know this is not happening, but just in case it is, if there's contractors who are taking uh, any of these products, put them in other homes or uh, along those lines, we're starting to take a look at that. What they were breaking into the, the vacant houses for uh, in the area was the copper. And so they were doing copper theft. So where you can take copper, we started impacting those places. We started doing inspections on those. We're starting to hold those people accountable if they're taking in copper. And we're starting to look for uh, the, the regular people who are out on a, on a regular basis. So we're being very proactive in the community as a whole, dealing with all burglaries. We also understood that there was a lot of youth who were walking up and down alley, alleys that were doing break-ins. And so we were addressing that too. So the guys have been on top of that. They will continue to be on top of it. And specifically for Edgewood, where the mayor was born and raised for 18 months, and that she wants a memorial. We're gonna we're gonna have to respond to that. Eric, could you uh, tell a little bit what you're doing? Yeah, in reference to the, uh, there was a pattern down there on the Edgewood Street and in that area, and we had identified two people that were that we thought were responsible for it. However, the uh, the uh, burglary investigation is still ongoing. However, we did target them uh, on the side for other crimes because they were their records indicated that they had robberies, they had burglaries, and. Uh, we started to target them and we got a drug case on them. They are currently in jail and the burglaries in that area stopped. So our, our, our job is to, 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 we're looking at all the patterns that occur and then looking at the recidivists and we're able to get in front of that pattern so that no more burglaries did occur in that neighborhood. You know, one of the things that, sorry, Madam Mayor. One of the things that I was telling the guys uh, and, and getting them to kind of focus on is I think crime is, is a system. Uh, whether it's violent crime here or burglaries there, I think it's all part of the system. And what really drives a lot of it for our city is narcotics. So if you have, uh, you have guys who are bringing narcotics into our city, you have drug dealers who are selling in an open-air drug market. When they start making money, they expand, they have conflict, they start shooting each other. Then you have other predators who go and rob the drug dealers who are selling the drugs for their money, so you have shootings that come out of there. Then you have burglaries and robberies that take place for the low-level people getting money to buy drugs that pushes the other pieces of the system. So I've been pushing the guys from the beginning that we will take a look at all crimes because I think it's all part of the system at different levels. And so what we're, we've been focusing on a lot, too, is drug users who are breaking into houses. And they're breaking into houses, breaking into cars to supply their drug habit to sell to the drug dealer on the corner. So uh, our focus has, has been very proactive as a result of them not only dealing with burglaries and robberies and dropping them, the violent shootings are dropping. Now, I know we've had some high-profile issues that took place with uh, young Mr. Mayfield, and we're going we're gonna to track that case down. But uh, most, of the, most of the violence in, in this district has reduced because they've looked at it as a system, and they will continue to look at it as, as a system to address the overall crime rate. I stay very close to the Southwest. Like I said, on a every 24 hours, tomorrow morning, he or his, his boss will be on the phone explaining to me over this, this nighttime what took place, where it was, what time, where did they break in, what did they take, what's the suspect looking like, and then what they're doing to respond to it to address it in a very quick fashion. The only thing, as you pick, pick, identify the next person, ask a question, the only other thing I would add to that is with the new police contract, what would, uh, if it's, you know, knock on wood and, and uh, prayerfully, when it's ratified, it will give us opportunity, um, you know, in those nighttime, in the overnight shift to put more officers on the street. So that's, it, when I talked about being a more nimble police department, that's what I'm talking about, that hopefully it will be ratified by the FOP. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Ms. Smith, that was a great suggestion about the light bulbs. That's something we will definitely look into and follow up with you. I spoke with Larry, he said that he has your contact information. Okay, great. I'll, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. One more suggestion on those burglaries. If Now that we all have cell phones now and we have Android phones and, and iPhones, take pictures of your possessions. Take pictures of the serial numbers on your possessions. Whether it's air conditioners or things, we are recovering uh, lost goods when we're arresting these guys. And, and take the time. Take a picture of it. Keep it, on, keep it in store so when we find these things, we can get the property back. We can hang, hang that burglary on that guy. Send him to jail. Okay. Thank Great. you. Great. We have Mrs. 
Elsie, who has a question that she would like to pose to uh, Madam Mayor or the Police Commissioner. Larry? Good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the city officials and the police department for the job that they do because it is a uh, difficult job. And uh, if we work with them, perhaps there'll be a change. One of the concerns that our community has, and, and in, they've given it to me in the form of a uh, letter, and that is in the 3000 block of Windsor Avenue, uh, we have many young teenagers and young adults who hang in front of steps, walls of vacant buildings, and this occurs during the afternoon and the late evening hours. And there are several vacant properties in this area. The citizens who live in this area are seniors. And of course, there are several churches and people go back and forth going to church and coming in in the evening. Uh, we're concerned about the safety of our senior citizens and we're asking that as the police officers cruise through the area, because they do on occasion, is it possible that they could shine a light on those vacant properties to kind of um, see whether or not there's any activity. And even if there isn't at that particular time, someone will tell someone else that the police came through, shined a light in, and we need to vacate that particular area. The other concern we have is the unoccupied houses that are in the 3,000 uh, block of Windsor. Again, here vacant lots. How do we find out who owns these lots, clean them up, or give them some sort of penalty for not keeping it up? Um, that would be quite helpful. Thank you. One other thing, and that is, how are individuals receiving licenses for approval for group homes in our community. And we have quite a few of them, and they are young people, and they are very disrespectful. Thank you. So, thank you. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna let uh, the commissioner deal with the, the public safety, the shining a light thing on the, the vacant lots and on the group home. Um, I am going to make sure that we double back with you after this, uh, since it's not a specific public safety issue. I do have information, and that's all right. I do have information that I would like to share with you, particularly on the vacant lots, and then we can connect you with the right information for the uh, the state licenses for these for these group homes. But I want to be want to keep to the to the rules, so I will make sure that we circle back, Commissioner. That's all right. John Eric, three thousand block of Windsor Avenue. Uh, I want you to pull out your cell phone right now, and I want you to call dispatch, and I want to send units over there right now. I don't want them to shine a light. I want them to get out of the cars. I want them to start engaging over there. So give them a call right now and send somebody over there right now. All right, our tell, next question. Tell them to take their clothes off, too. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, you're three for three tonight. <laughs> yes, ma'am. To my right, we have a question. Christian, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Cynthia Tinsley. I'm vice president of the Carrollton Ridge Community Association. Ms. Connie Fowler, I'm sitting in the second row. Ms. Connie Fowler, sitting in the second row, is our president. Um, I have a question, um, Commissioner, uh, with regard to foot patrol. Uh, we kept hearing over and over again, there's going to be more foot patrol, there's going to be more foot patrol. It happens for a little bit, then it's pulled back. Mm -hmm. Technology, innovation, all of that is wonderful and we need that, but the human condition doesn't change. Um, there still needs to be that connection um, and, and, it, and that's something that really works. And everybody knows it works, but we just can't seem to get it going. Um, so, and the other thing, which I know is gonna be controversial, has to do with dogs. Um, from the 60s, um, with the 
the use of um, police dogs attacking, um, doing segregation, it's, it's put a, a bitter taste in people's mouths. But to deal with the open air drug trafficking, if we had some drug sniffing dogs who could occasionally come into those areas and sniff out, that would put drug dealers on the alert. That would help cut down, I really believe, a lot of this um, open air drug uh, market because they know that the dogs can sniff out their drugs. Um, it can force them, you know, force some of it off the streets. So I'd like to hear um, what's the possibility of doing that. I know it's controversial. Um, there'll probably be a lot of uh, slack and in, 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 uh, people arguing about it, but sometimes we have to get past that and look at the reality of something that, um, that could be beneficial and that can work. And uh, <laughs> um, the other thing was, um, the, it was never addressed about, the, um, the evangelist had asked a question too about um, 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 the arts in school that's been cut out or being cut out of school that helps to, helps young people to, um, to be able to express themselves um, in a way instead of just brute force through sports. Um, and then my last thing was, um, there needs to be a balance between zero tolerance and, um, and tolerance. Even something as simple, and, and I'd like to know who I would talk to about this part, um, enforcing indecent exposure. Um, when we have young men with their pants walking around, I mean, that's, that's on the books, indecent exposure with their pants showing up. You know, you go into a restaurant, you go in by the buffet, you go into the supermarket around food. It's a health issue. It's a sanitation issue. Um, and all flatulent instances of flatulence is not dry. And so somebody's scooting across a restaurant seat in a buffet, and I'm coming in there, or kids coming in there, sit, it's, it's, a sanit it's a health it, It's a health issue. And um, it's not violent crime, but it's one of those instances where somebody said they'd sue because um, we're denying um, African-American men their heritage. My heritage as, as African-American has to do with, with pride struggle and, and um, it, 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 I'm just so passionate about that. It's, it's just, somebody just needs to stand up and have some guts and, and, and just enforce that and do something about it. But. So I'll, I'll, Thank you. I'll back into it. Yeah, I think, you know, I don't know too many of, us in here that think that that's appropriate uh, to, you know, for the young people, uh, particularly young men, to wear their, well, it, whoever it is, you know, I don't think you're going to find anybody that would take their time to come to a meeting like this tonight that would think it's appropriate. The, the, the challenge in, in that is in that line. You talked about zero tolerance. I've never, you know, I'm not a proponent of, of that. I am a proponent of and when I talked about it, the community stepping up. I think it would be much, that message is much better coming from somebody in the community than coming from a police officer where then you have people who we're looking to, young people to be partners that are feeling like the police are targeting them because of, because of the, the way they look. And, um, you know, I, I, I need to be honest and clear, I, I'm not gonna prioritize behind being out for my officers. I think some of that is where we as a community have to step up. Um, with respect to arts and stuff in the school, it's not that I didn't ignore, ignored it, this is, this is me, the mayor and the police officer. School, school is not represented here. Um, I think that's a conversation that all of us uh, should be having with uh, the school system about the prioritization of arts and that type of programming. I certainly support that in the work that I do in the after school, with the after school programs that we fund, as well as uh, in the rec center, but that should just be directed toward them, and I'll let the commissioner take the other part. I'm going to try to catch up on all 17 of your questions that you had in there. Um, the first one is, is uh, foot patrols. Um, you're right. One, one of the things that uh, we did in uh, every class that came out last year, we put them on foot patrols. Uh, their first six months were walking, walking uh, the different districts. Uh, I think it, very, it worked very well. And we put them in the most problematic areas. We put them in the western, we put them in the eastern. And part of what I wanted them to do is get, number one, get used to working in the community, speaking to community residents, going into the businesses, and feeling at ease out of that car. 
Uh, but what we really have to push, because to, to a certain extent, we have to keep a mechanized police department. We have to be able to get to point A to point B. If somebody's breaking into your house, I can't have an officer running you know, uh, two or three miles to get to your house. Uh, so some of us have to stay in our cars. What I have shifted is the, the responsibility or the discretion to the captains and the majors that they can put out foot beats where they, where they have them. And, and the majors are putting them out at different points in time. We have a large class, and, um, and what's going to take, because, because our attrition is uh, down a little bit, and we're playing catch up. We have a large class that has started uh, about two months ago, and it'll probably be coming about a month ago, and it'll probably be coming out in November. When we get those large classes, we're going to look to put them out. Uh, the majors have asked me to take them, take them off the streets when you're when you have winter time out there and it's 10, 10 degrees or five degrees because they need to have somewhere uh, to uh, eat and, and kind of rest. So when it warms up, we're going to do we're going to continue to do more foot patrols. I am a very big proponent of foot patrols. I can't do it all over the city because we just don't have the resources. But we should do it in different communities, different neighborhoods, and we're going to continue to push at that. So my my pledge to you is to try to do as many foot patrols as we possibly can. I'm a believer in it, so I am with you on that one. Uh, the drug, the drug sniffing dogs, uh, we do have some, some dogs that do that, but I have something that's even better than that. Uh, Sean is going to come up and, and uh, come up and talk. He has been, until recently, he's been in charge of a thing called Special Enforcement Section. I had to, to kind of tear that section apart. Uh, and before, it was called VSIT, Violent Crime Impact Team. And we did a lot of uh, stop and frisk related stuff. We did a lot of zero tolerance related kind of stuff. And I think we had, over the years, we've had a impact on the community where we're not seen as as a um, supporting part to help the community move forward. Uh, I don't think you stop every blackmail that you see. I don't think that you stop and, and uh, search everybody. I think what we do is that we identify the violent repeat offenders, we know the bad players that are in there, and we go after them. And we go after them with a laser focus to remove them from the community that they're, ca they're causing ha harm. What has been shown in scientific data, empirical data, time and time again, that is somewhere close to, uh, somewhere close to about 5 to 8 percent uh, people cause the pain in our community. Those are the five to eight percent of the people that we're looking to take out. But stopping every every African American male or every minority, uh, I think it's problematic. And I think that's what you see in New York. And you see the response to that in New York and how city, citizens are are standing up to that. Here, I'm taking I'm, ta I'm taking this organization through a lot of training. Uh, to give us and give my officers different skills to make sure that we don't fall into that same the same uh, issues that New York has fallen into, and we move uh, we move to be a professional organization that resolves those issues. Even Bratton is moving away from that too when he's up in New York. So we're moving to get away from zero tolerance, focus, and take the guys out. The open air drug markets and the success the successes that you've had. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, um, like the commissioner said, back in July, I was uh, the captain of the Southwest District. Strangely enough, some of you might recognize me before. Uh, the commissioner asked me to come down, promote me to major, and had me take in charge of the special enforcement section. Well, the first thing I did was sneak around for two months and figure out who needed to be there and who didn't. And within that third month, I came to the commissioner. And I said, sir, can I kick out a third of my guys? And he's like, what? I subtracted 28% of my manpower because they were just young, hardworking officers, but they didn't have the skill set to do the kind of operational work that we needed to get done. Undercover work, covert surveillance, dealing with informants, usage of the covert, the, the narcotics investigations like we needed to get done. Um, shortly after that, we reconfigured the manpower um, to put them in certain units, the violent repeat offenders unit. We have a squad dedicated just for that. Goes right with what the mayor is talking about before. We have major case squads now that can take an investigation from ground level all the way up to wiretap. Um, undercover squads. We had barely one, now we have several. Um, we don't have any canine dogs yet, but we're working on that. And <laughs> no. um, the undercover operations, just to talk about them and themselves, uh, 735 posts in the Western, which connects to Longwood and North Avenue, right by Cobb and State. Um, without a doubt, it was the most violent post in the city last year, last July and August, without a doubt. Uh, it drove the Western and Southwest District violent crime right there on that border. Um, we were able to infiltrate that organization four to six weeks. Um, I won't get into the strategy so much, but just know that after we were done, we uh, indicted every single member of the organization within a six-week period. How many, how many people did you take up on that? There was nine. So the, these nine people were causing all the violence in this entire neighborhood. And by, you know, subtraction, you know, addition by subtraction, manipulating the manpower of the special enforcement section, we were able to do the things that you 
want us to do when it comes to subtracting these bad guys from your neighborhood. It was as simple as that. Then you had uh, Oliver. Talk about the other parts in the community that you've taken yep. off and the numbers. The next operation was the Oliver community in the Eastern. Another example of one of the most violent posts in the Eastern District. Usually the Eastern District, you know, it's a very violent neighborhood. We were able to infiltrate the uh, cocaine shop there, which had, uh, it was seven guys in all in the cocaine shop, and four of them were actually wanted for murder. The homicide section just needed that little piece to, to close these cases, but we infiltrated them with the drug, the drug angle operationally on the back end, and strangely enough, while we're doing the cocaine undercover operation, there's a heroin shop right next to us. So not only we indict the cocaine shop, but we had 16 guys in the heroin shop that we also piggybacked off of that and had them all indicted simultaneously as well as one, cons one criminal conspiracy enterprise. You did Pig Town recently? We did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Washington Boulevard. I know Washington Boulevard's had a lot of problems down at the bottom end, especially by Carroll Park. So what we did is we uh, built up our informant pool for the area, and we actually had a, a group of informants and undercover operatives go into the area and do purchases from uh, two different times. It was uh, nine houses the first time and seven houses the second time. And I think we had about 12 people arrested or indicted, and the last gentleman was actually on probation for murder, and he had two handguns in his house, uh, which we weren't sure if he was trying to take his wife into custody as, as a, uh, a shield, but we got to him first, and he's in jail, and he's done. What, uh, what the other things, yeah. What the other things that uh, he's kind of he's kind of modest about saying is every one of these areas, and he's only giving you some of them. Uh, there's a lot more. Every one of these areas where his guys have gone in, the violence has subsided. It has stopped. These guys haven't uh, come back. We put them away. State's attorney's office has stood up strong and been big supporters with us on this one. We're worked in. We're worked in the right direction. So his team that is very productive, and we're not doing zero tolerance, but we're putting people in. We're putting the right people and the murderers and the killers. We're putting them in jail, and they're going there for a long period of time. And where we're doing it, the crime is not coming back, and that's what we will stick with, and we'll continue to go along the same directions. So I think what they're saying is they want you back in the southwest to uh, start doing some activities over here. Right. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We have, before I go to the next question, and Chris, I'm definitely coming in to you after this question. Madam Mayor, I just wanted to uh, announce that I didn't see coming in. Delegate uh, Jill Carter has joined us. Uh, if she would just raise it. She's sitting behind Miss, Miss Allen. Yes, ma'am, please introduce yourself, Chris. Um, good evening. My name is Carol McCoy, and I'm president of Marl Park Community Association. I want to thank you for your visit to Southwest District. Um, Marl Park has a terrible problem with our youth. We have what's called the hit squad, and they range from the age maybe 14 to 20, and they terrorize the youth. Our dry cleaners, Miss Bessie, 90 years old, has been robbed twice. Our hairdressers, she, the wind has been broken in. You cannot even walk. The seniors cannot walk to get their hair done. Now, not only is that, but, but now we have the junior hit squad. And they're from like 8 to 14. This is no exaggeration. The youth are out of control. Now, we want to help you to help us. So we've engaged partners. We have the Baltimore Guardian Angels that their home base is in Morrill Park. And they do patrols for us. We're very blessed with that. And we've engaged many communities here in Nomi. I go to all the associations to learn what our neighbors are doing. I attend Southern, and I heard you speak at Southern, how you cleaned up Lexington Market. Well, I work in downtown Baltimore, and I was thrilled with that. So maybe you can help us with the 24 and the 2500 block of Washington Boulevard. Now, maybe, I asked the councilman, maybe 10 years back, we got a grant and we had bikes, and, two of, and the businesses helped to pay for them. Correct, Ed? Yes. And we had two patrolmen on bikes. And I think that really helped because they patrolled in the neighborhood. Now, I don't know what happened to the bikes or if you need new ones or whatever the situation is. How can we help you to take our neighborhood back? They're off the hooks. You go right now to Washington Boulevard. The major is very well aware of it. Breaking windows. It, it's just out of control, off the hook. Sneed, when we leave here, we're going to 24, 2500 block, 24 and 2500 block of Washington. So when we leave here, that's where we're going. Uh, Pe Eric, could you step up uh, if you're familiar with that and uh, try to address some of the situations over there? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Okay, Chris, you had a question. Well, he's, he's oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's answering. Yes, sir. 
Okay, in re in, can you guys hear me? Yeah. This is, uh, no, you actually, need, you sir, need we need the. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay, uh, in reference to the crime down on Washington Boulevard, and again, uh, in, in looking at that, we've had two robberies year to date on Washington Boulevard 3224 Washington Boulevard, which is closed by an arrest, and 2500 Washington Boulevard. That was the situation where uh, it was officer involved shooting at. Uh, that case has been closed as well. That, that person is in jail. The rest of the robberies down in Morrill Park, we have five, or we, I'm sorry, we have six, five of which are closed by arrest. Um, we do patrol down there. Uh, I know we get calls about the Green Apple a lot. We go down there, and this past, uh, this past winter, we got some calls. We did some activity down there, uh, but it's not the high crime uh, drugs, um, and, and you spoke about D, or you spoke about the Hitman Squad. You spoke about DMI. This past uh, a, a couple months ago, we did do an operation involving DMI. Well, they uh, call themselves the Hit Squad. They're nothing but kids wannabes. I, I understand that. Um, but what, what we are doing is I talked to operations right prior to this meeting, and they did actually give me the names, and they are currently looking into those people right now. I don't, I'm not again like like. Major, or like Colonel Miller said, I can't divulge what they're doing right now, but we are aware of the hit squad, we are aware of DMI, and we are actively pursuing an investigation against them. And, and Ms. McCoy, we can follow up. If it's, if the, if it's related to a food uh, establishment, I can work with the, the it's in, that's in your district, right? Uh, we'll work with the, the councilman and identify those food establishments that are feeding into that trafficking, and there are other ways. We have other tools to deal with it. D DMI is, it stands for Dead Man Incorporated. Uh, it, it's basically a, a Ca Caucasian uh, a prison gang uh, that uh, was started in, in the area. Their offshoot uh, subset of Black Gorilla Family, actually. Uh, and it's one of the only names that I don't, that in a city that didn't come from Southern California that I wasn't familiar with. But I think your point is this, and, and, and I'm sure that you don't want to hear us rattle off stats because you don't feel safe. And what you're trying to get across to me is that you don't feel safe. So I think what he was also trying to communicate is that there's something in the works that he just is, doesn't want to talk too much about at this point in time. But I will, I will myself, right after this, I want to see it. I want to touch it. I want to feel it. I will go over there and see. And tomorrow, uh, when I sit down with my command staff, we'll have a conversation about it. Uh, Thank you, sir. That, the second part of that is we have what's called Spence Street. Um, there was a shooting there not too long ago with some, one of these police officers. Well, I call it Bad Boys Lane because every boy on that street has a record. And it's been drugs, it's been guns, it's been everything. So I call it Bad Boy Lane. But nothing is ever done. They're back out again. So if this is repeat offenders, can we do something about these kids? We can, and, and we can follow up because a lot of what it, it's clear that something is, the, the investigation is going on in that area that's probably not best since this is you know being broadcast. So we, we will follow up with you directly, Ms. Thank McCoy. you, Ms. Thank you, Tustin, 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 Tustin. Madam Mayor, and thank you, Ms. McCoy. Chris Williams, Hunting Ridge. Tustin, Tustin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Williams, uh, President of Hunting Ridge Community Assembly. And uh, my question, uh, I have, okay, excuse me. All right, um, my question is a three-part. Um, it also deals with um, what programs are in place, such as um, to avoid dangerous idle time for youth. Um, one of the programs was very successful. And before before I start, let me first say um, a special kudos and compliments to Major Jim Hanley, as well as uh, Captain Eric. Uh, Pekka of the Southwest Precinct. Uh, they respond in a very timely fashion. Anything Hunting Ridge Community Assembly has needed, they've been very responsive. Um, and we'd like to uh, extend thank you to them for the excellent work they've done in our community. Now, uh, the first part I'd like to address is also we have a wish list uh, for the Southwest uh, Precinct. Um, as the new Salmas facility is uh, vacant. Uh, what we would like to see is a new facility for the Southwest Precinct officers. Uh, if you look at the offices and the conditions that they uh, are work on, it, you know, it's a less than substandard, but they make the best of it. And I'd like to thank them and uh, Sergeant Duncan of the Neighborhood Services as well. Um, we, what we would also like to see is with that new Salmas vacant facility is a youth center. Uh, a portion of that youth center, a place for our youth to go, uh, because I think with youth, um, by me working in the school system now, I know the youth need a place to go after three o'clock, okay? Um, a lot of times youth 
want to do the right thing, but a lot of times if there's no one to reinforce, I think that would be something in place that we would like to see. Um, also, I'd like to ask about the Explorers program um, and to see if that is continued. I know they were once very active in the community and I think it was a, a positive reinforcement. So kids at an early age would look at the police not necessarily from a negative impact, but a positive impact in how they can see a future career. And last but not least, we would like to see greater outreach from the um, from the state's attorney's office as far as um, impact. So we as a community can uh, serve impact letters um, so we can draft for these individuals who are arrested and tried. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. We're gonna go in reverse order. I know that there's a representative here, at least one from the state's attorney's office, so she'll, we'll make sure that you connect. Um, uh, she stood up and acknowledges she's going to connect with you. With respect to the police explorers, I'm going to let the commissioner talk about that. One of the best explorer programs that is in the city is located not too far from here in the Southern District. Uh, and it's an incredible group of young people, and that's something that we believe in. Uh, the, the explorers program is, is uh, you know, our, our farm team for the police department and uh, fire chief, uh, our chief of the Fire Department Chief Ford has been working very hard to uh, develop that same type of uh, program and, and, and stronger for the fire department, uh, working at Douglas and Dunbar, uh, and to really create pathways for careers in public safety with our young people. Uh, everyone says we want more of our police officers to be from the city and live in the city, and they say the same thing about the fire department. I'm so proud that uh, you know when I uh, was interviewing Chief Ford, he talked about wanting to make that a priority, and he is. Uh, so we're encouraging our young people who want uh, to have careers uh, in, in public safety, whether it's through the Explorers or through the programs. I keep pointing over here. I think he's... Oh, Oh, he's st okay. Well, Chief Ford, y'all to tell him I said nice things about him. Um, either you know through those programs, we, we're really serious about getting um, you know creating those pathways for our, our young people to get into the, these positions. Um, with respect to New Salmas, I, I just want you to be aware. Um, this is uh, this is part of the promise to the community when the development was uh, built that that was coming down. And that that money is part of the budget that the that the delegates just passed that the state approved money for uh, that facility to come down. That was part of a very very long standing agreement with that community. Yes. Just uh, there was a couple questions that, that needed to cover off of that. Um, we do have a, a very strong explorer program. Each district has their explorer program. Uh, what I like to see here in the southwest is to expand. Explore program that we have, and I think this is a grand opportunity in which to do it. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, Eric is right in the middle of answering a question right now, but uh, perhaps what we need to look at is not only getting the good kids involved in Explorer program, but some of these young kids over here that may be on the line in some of these neighborhoods that need activities. Uh, part of what we're also doing, I was talking to the mayor and she had given me an idea that it with uh, Rex and Park, they also have mobile vans. And part of what, we do, what we're doing now, and I have a Lieutenant Colonel Mel, Mel Russell looking into it, we're, we're going to borrow their van that has basketball hoops and different things in the back of it. And our NSU officers are going to go to those areas where we have some of the problematic issues. And we're going we're gonna to cordon off the streets and we're going to do activities with uh, the young people out there in a very uh, positive way to start to see for even with my police officers to start interacting with them, especially with the summertime coming up. And I don't have enough vans to be all over the city, but in areas that are bringing up here, I think it serves a couple different things. Just like the Explorer program, I told you I was mentored. I was an explorer. I was a police explorer, which made an impact on my life long term. And so if we can get these young kids who are on the borderline to get involved with this police explorer program, I think it's going to have ramifications that people can't even realize. With us getting out, out there and playing with kids on, on the streets uh, in the middle of the daytime, you may not think that's a big thing. But many of these kids are used to us. The only time they see us is when we're dragging their aunts and uncles off to jail. And so when you can take that moment in a second and be Officer Bill and playing basketball with them, it goes a long way. There's a little thing that I do when I travel around the city. Anytime I see kids playing on a basketball court and my, my guys were driving around, I make them stop. And I get out of the car. And what usually happens is I walk right in the middle of a basketball game. And I say, can I have the basketball? And they look at me. We're not giving you the basketball. You're the popo. We don't even want to talk to you. And you can see all the attitude. You can see the eyebrows. You can see that, you know, it's almost like they're smelling something that's really stinky that you just walked, walked up on. And so then what I usually do is I pull out a $20 bill. And I said, you know, here's the three-point line. Who here can make, make a three-point? I give you $20. 
laws. So one or two of them will come over and they'll try and they'll miss it. And then another walk up and say, are you serious? I go, yeah, I'm real serious. And then they'll start lining up and they'll start shooting. Then I'll go back to half court and I go, I have $40 here. Who can make the shot at 40? And then you have all these kids come out of nowhere to take the shot. And then by the time what they don't get, by the time I'm finished 30 minutes later, they're talking, they're funning, we're having conversations. And they're, they're, we were on another part of the city. And one of those kids that I don't even remember walked up to me and just wanted to say, officer, officer, remember I was on the basketball court and you guys are over there and you stopped and you said, hey, 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 hey. And just that moment, <clears throat> just that moment of playing around with them made a huge difference. And I actually pay them the money too when they make it, when I have to give them that $40. That's why they really think about that $40. But, uh, you know, afterwards, those kids talk about that. Us getting out there with that, with that, that truck and getting out there in that, that street with the kids, that makes a difference. The Explorer program makes a difference. So I want, to, I want a police organization that is seen in a different way, that we're not just coming to neighborhoods to take people to jail, that we're part of the community. And we have to take on some of these, these tough young people. And so what I, I really want my officers to, to start doing it, and I have to give them the tools to do it and make sure they feel comfortable. And part of those walking beats helps the officers feel comfortable. They need to grab on and mentor young people. I've been doing this for 33 years. I can't tell you how many, how many mentorees I've had. I have young kids that I started with when they were 10 who are grown adults now, and they're calling me, telling me, thank you for that contact. Those contacts go a long way. That's where we bring hope. That's when we're be we become a part of a community. So whether explorer programs, whether taking time to get out of, out of the car and talk to these young people, that's what we're going to push for. That's what I'm pushing for to make a difference within the community as a whole. Thank you, Commissioner. Just a few notes to make before uh, we go on to the next question. I'm going to, there's a gentleman, yes sir, I'm coming to you. I'm going to have Miss Monique pose a question and then I'll come to you. But I, and to the lady, yes, put your hand up again. I see you, yes. The principal uh, has a limited staff after normal working hours here at the school. So we just want to make sure that we wrap up in a timely fashion so that he and his staff are able to shut the building down and leave and we can go in an orderly way. So we're trying to do this quickly. Uh, while we, before we go to Miss Monique Washington, is Andrea Jackson still here from the Maryland Transit Administration? Can you raise your hand? Okay, you're in the back, okay. Can you connect with Mr. Warren Smith? Can you raise your hand, sir? Okay, he has a question, as did someone else from the red line. I just wanted to connect you with uh, the young lady who represents the red line, who's with us tonight. Okay, Miss Monique Washington, and then from you, sir, you in an aqua shirt, and then the lady here, and then we will move on. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, Sergeant Specs. Pleasure to meet you. We all can agree here tonight that things didn't happen overnight and they're not gonna get resolved overnight. So it's important and vital to community leaders to form some kind of organization where we can work and partner together with the city to get things accomplished for our youths. We know the recreation centers were closed, so that's a done deal, it's over with. Now we have to step in and do what we have to do as community leaders. With that being said, I um, came up with the idea because I was really passionate, especially after Mr. Mayfield was murdered, um, with the fact that our young adults don't have enough positive influence, mentoring, recreation, whatever. So I came up with the solution for my association. We're going to start a baseball league. With going forward with that, and I'm ashamed to say this, I walked my community just recently and found we had three baseball fields. So where Stokes Drives is, is being um, started this week to be repaired. With that being said, I believe another solution would be for the laws to be, the laws are outdated. We know that. So somewhere along the way, the laws need to be updated so that the criminals can get a message that they can't continue to go through and just take our, our use because they do have a promising future. We can pull some of them back in. Um, also, I want to say, is there some kind of way that the city can partner with the association since the recreation centers are being closed 
to allow us some kind of funding. Can you say that. Are you talking about one that's open now? Because we're, there's no, there's no well, closure some, on the future. Well, some of them were closed, right? Yes, but some of them in your district, particularly Mary E. Robin, that was slated to be closed, was we made a way to keep it open. So I'm not 100% sure which one you're talking so, about. So, well, we have closed. one on Wicklow Road. I've been concerned about this for the last five years. I was told the city didn't own it. Then I told, then I was told the school owned it. Called the school. They said they didn't own it. And it's from my understanding. So it was turned over to the school, so we can follow up. I don't know. No, I'm telling you. It's turned over it to was? the school. It was? Okay. So we want to, with it being in the community, find some kind of way that we can get access to it as well. Because I'm seeing they have a lot of little tournaments down there, but no one has made an effort to include our um, kids from the community. So with that being said, is there some kind of way that the city can partner with the association to give us some kind of funding because I had to go out, it took me almost a year to find sponsorship to get this going and I don't think it should be that hard for our young adults. So I will say um, a, a couple of things. Yes, we're willing to partner. The, the, the issue with the, the funding is we, ha we are establishing the partnerships that are reopening some of our uh, closed rec centers when we have a partner that has the capacity to raise funds as well and to operate. So um, I think it deserves uh, further conversation, and I will make sure the Office of Neighborhoods follows up and coordinates a meeting with you and Recreation and Parks uh, for the program. With respect to the one that is operated, that is currently owned by the school, that's a whole different conversation that has to happen with the school system, and we can uh, help facilitate that uh, communication with the principal. Just like here with Principal Perry, you know, he, we're here because of the leadership of uh, this principal. Uh, anything that happens in that school facility will happen because of the leadership of the principal in that building. So we're, I'm, uh, I agree that it is uh, essential that we create the partnerships. I just want to, uh, we are determined to make those partnerships that work and that have the capacity to continue. And that's why we're going to uh, set up a meeting so you can sit down. Gus, I know we're short on time. Can I get to yes, say sir. a couple things real quick? Uh -huh. Eric, one of the things that uh, Christopher Williams just got, got up and he walked away, he talked about the Explorer program. I want you to start thinking about how do we expand that Explorer program that we have here in the Southwest. So uh, I want to walk away and actually come back with a plan to do that. I want to introduce this young man over here. We were talking about people getting involved in community. He's standing there by the door. He's kind of, I'm embarrassing him right now. Uh, his name is, is Ryan. And the reason I, I, I kind of put, put, uh, point Ryan out Ryan lives in one of the toughest neighborhoods uh, in our city. Uh, it's one of the most violent parts of the city. He is a police officer. He stands out in that community because he does not look like that community, but he lives there. And when I met Ryan, I, say, I asked him, why don't they break into your house? Why don't they smash your car? Why don't, they, why don't they shoot at you? And Ryan is, not only does he live there and has lived there for a number of years, he's part of the church. And the more important thing that he does is that he mentors the young people in that neighborhood. And they have a healthy respect for him. When we're out on the street, you see kids run up to him all the time. Mr. Ryan, Mr. Ryan, how, how are you doing uh, in different parts of the city? And so the reason I take the time to say that is that, you know, these police officers get banged for a lot of different things. What you don't get to hear, you don't get to hear about the Ryans. You don't get to hear about the guys who are given a lot to try to turn around our youth within our city. And so anytime that I get a chance to highlight these guys who are doing it in the way that I think policing should be done as a mentor and trying to bring hope to a community, trying to help kids to uh, succeed, i like to point him out. So please give him a round of applause and who he is. Yes, sir, and after you, then you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You have a question. Has there ever been an investigation or is an investigation going on concerning these witnesses that's being killed here in Baltimore City? How, uh, how are these other killers getting there? and killing these people like this. Someone, uh, I think it was Fortnite and White Marsh. Has any kind of investigation being done about how these people getting these people out, killing them? We can have more witnesses. Also, in reference to the motorbikes, I mean, uh, dirt bikes, possible solution, I go to New Jersey, they do not let customers pump gas. They have a service attendant who will pump gas and put it in your car. If we can get something like that here in Baltimore, that's fine. Maybe that can help. That's part of the solution. And anybody wants gas, you can get a one-gallon gas for uh, 
your lawnmower. I mean, you know, we can come up there and you're 25, and I can't understand people coming to Baltimore just uh, bikes. They got them bikes, they passing drugs. Uh, th thank you for your comments, kind sir. Uh, it is a, a lot of people coming for the bikes. Uh, that is a culture not just in Baltimore, it's in Philadelphia, it is in Jersey, it's in New York, it's on the East Coast, and that's one of the things that I learned. But, you know, one of, one of the things I think is that we got to be very careful when we're saying that we have a lot of people killed because they're witnesses, because what that, that, what that does is sin. And Eric, let, me, let me finish. I was respectful for you, so just give me, give me a chance. Um, because we don't, not saying that it doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen with frequency. And that is a critical piece to put out there. If you say in a meeting that people are getting killed left and right, that sends chills up and down the spine. Anybody, anytime that we would have a scenario like that where a witness was intimidated, we go after that with a passion. Uh, because I, I need people to step up and say, this is what's going on. Uh, I need people to, to call in and not be afraid that that's, that's occurring. Uh, we have, with our violence that takes place, there is um, a number of things that are, are criminal versus criminal a lot of times. Uh, when you have a drug trade or a drug shop, when, it, it, when it's making money and it wants to expand, then you have conflict with another drug, open air drug market. Uh, I share with you also when you have uh, uh, street robbers robbing other drug dealers. And so a, a number of times these drug dealers know the other drug dealers that are, are taking place. And, I, and, I gotta, and this is not good people are, who are being impacted this way. And no, no one should be giving out names anyway. But here's what takes place. You have this mythology that goes on that that you have no snitching. Well, you're not supposed to snitch. You can't tell on people, and you tell that to the youth. Want me to tell you some secrets? When we get those criminals into a room at the police station, they tell on their grandmother, they tell on their mama, they tell on their daddy, they tell on everybody. So it's a mythology. It's the young kids who believe in that silliness and the young kids that kind of hold on to it. But the hardcore uh, criminals are out there, they don't believe in that. They'll give up anybody so they don't, have to do any, they don't have to do any hard time. And they will blame other people for giving up that information too. So it's not always that someone is leaking some type of information. It's the culture that, that, that the guys are in. The big bigger piece that, that I'm trying to get across is, you know, I may not be able to save them, and I take this back to, to this, and it goes back to the Explorer program, it goes back to the walking beach, it goes back to these kids out on the street. We have to get these kids before they get to that stage. We have to make an impact on the front end because once they're in that system, I'll be very honest with you, once they're in their system, we go after violent repeat offenders. So if we arrested you once, we go back after you again, and once you get into that system, it becomes very difficult for you to get out, of, get out of that system. So it becomes very critical that we start with the babies before they start down that road. We, we have... You're next. Sir. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We have it literally, it is now 8.51. Okay, I'm going to talk real fast. Good yes, evening, everyone. Thanks, thank all the officers for coming. <laughs> Thanks, Southwest Police Department, for all that they do. I've been a foster parent for 39 years, and any time I call Southwest, they are there within minutes. But my question is this, Madam Mayor. What can we do for that population between the ages of 18 and 25 of males that are on the corners, many of them have high school diplomas, many of them have been to college for a year or two, but they have no jobs. And the just an example, the people that do the work on the highways, they seem to all be there with out of town tags and with people that are working that don't speak English. So the black males and the white Caucasians and all that would fall into that group that could do that work. They're not getting those jobs because they're, they're given to those other people. What I'm saying is we need to do something to save that population. All of those young men are, have, don't have jail records. All of them are not drug users. They just don't have jobs. And I think the city needs to do something to help us help that population. That's all of these communities. Help that population that need jobs in that, in that age bracket. So first, thank you for your, your patience. I know that you've been wanting to get to that question. I agree, uh, we, you know, that we uh, certainly need to do more to outreach to, uh, to, to that 
uh, demographic that we have in the city. That's why I fought so hard to, to put in uh, an executive order that required contracts uh, over a certain amount of money. If they're doing any new hiring, they have to publicize those jobs through the Mayor's Office of Employment Development first. That's why we, on, we not only have our main uh, Mayor's Office of Community, uh, uh, Mayor's Office of Employment Development centers where we do the training, where we help connect people with jobs. We don't just have them one or two places. We put uh, those job hubs in the community. There's one, there's one not too far from here in South Southwest, so we could say to those young men, you don't have to go all the way to Mondam, and you don't have to go uh, all the way downtown. We're coming to you so we can help you connect to those jobs. That's why I uh, fought for legislation to expand the opportunities for people who wanted to apply for the casino. We, we worked too hard to, to make that uh, casino happen, not to make the opportunities available to uh, Baltimore City residents. And I want to thank the delegation, the, the, the delegate, Delegate Oaks, Delegate Carter, who are here, um, who helped support that initiative to ex to expand the opportunities for so for more young people, more people could have access to those jobs. And on top of fighting for it, then we took the, the jobs tour to every district in the city, every every district, 14 districts, 14 job fairs, plus the, the, the big uh, job fairs that we had for, for the casino opportunity. So if you know, if you have young people like that, please make sure that you tell them uh, to either go online, because you know if they would want something, if they wanted something else on online, well, I don't know, I mean, we can do a whole lot of claiming, or, or we can, you know, I'm telling you what to tell them to do. After you give them the information, if you have something else to suggest that we do with these young people, I'm all, I'm all for hearing this, the, uh, you know, so we have to, yeah. So we and, and just to just to add for the for the people that we are capturing that not when I say capture we're capturing their attention with the the night hoops baseball I mean baseball basketball that I talked about part of uh, that uh, thing is they yes they play basketball but they get some of those uh, those job skills and soft skills that they need to be able to be employed before the basketball game starts so there are a lot of things out there we just have to make sure that we are making sure that young people know about it and that we are doing more, we, we have to, you know, sometimes it takes community people dragging them there, um, because if they're claiming they've been there and they don't have anything to show for it, you have to ask the question, did they really do it? Madam Mayor, on that note, we're gonna have you go ahead and close out, and I just would like to, again, say thank you, and we have literally less than, I have 8.56, so we have less than five minutes uh, before the principal has to close the building, Madam Mayor. The fire so, chief is back. Niles made it back. The mayor was saying all those nice things about him. I mean, make sure. Why does everybody love firemen? Give him a round of applause. I will say this. In the, in, oh, please, in the, please, in the, please. In the less than four minutes that we have, I don't want to. I don't. I don't need to make a closing thing except for to say thank you. If you have not had your question answered and your hand is still up, I am asking mayor's office and neighborhood people to connect with you right now so we can make sure that your question gets yes, answered. Absolutely. Thank you so so much for coming. Coming out. God bless you. Thank you, Madam Mayor.